Welcome to my GS lab. There is no recipe for choosing the correct interpolation method and the many parameters you, the user, have to choose. You must understand the sample data that are used for the interpolation, and you have to have a good understanding how that variable can change spatially. It is very easy to create meaningless interpolated raster surfaces. Here, I simply show you the options and what impact they may have on your interpolated surface. We are going to interpolate soil samples taken on a farmer's field. These soil samples have been analyzed in a lab for a multitude of chemicals, including phosphorus. We are going to display the sampling points as sticks and we extrude by the value of the measured phosphorus amount in the soil. The, the taller the stick, the higher the phosphorus amount. And we can then make pin needles out of these just to visualize them better. And we will use this point cloud to interpolate surfaces that resemble this point cloud in terms of trend and spatial variability. Here is one trend surface uh, out of many that we are going to create uh, that is based on this kind of point cloud. Let's create a number of interpolated raster surfaces under the spatial analyst tools. Under interpolation, we find the number of tools I want to show you today, the inverse distance weighting, the natural neighbor, the spline, and also the trend analysis. Let's start with a simple trend analysis. When we open up the trend tool already pre-filled out here, we're using soil phosphorus levels uh, that are in our attribute table. We create a trend output file that's in my table of contents over here. Uh, with a grid cell size of 5 meters and at the moment we're using the default environmental settings and all we're doing is, is a linear regression between all these points with a polynomial of 0 which will give us simply the mean surface. The result looks like this. I will apply for all my results the same symbology these are our phosphorus levels interpolated from our point data. And here they are displayed in yellow because the mean value is around 44. If we quickly look at the statistics, we have a mean value of 43.5, we have a median value of just under 40. It is relatively normally distributed altogether, uh, so we should have a fair idea about our min value, our max value, and our mean value, uh, so as to be able to judge whether the surface is relatively true to the point that we use to create the surface. When we display the trend of order zero, which is our mean, it becomes very evident that it is not going through the points, it's just the mean flat surface that's being created. We will see that the default map extent follows the point distribution going to the most northern, southern, western, and eastern points. And we can control that, of course, in our environment settings, setting the extent. In our case, I want to use a farm extent that I have available. So I turn my farm layer off again. And here, using now a polynomial of one, which gives me a single trend in one direction, you see that now the resulting raster surface is following the original farm extent that I had before. You see here the southern end 
we may already get at the edge a little bit far away from existing sampling points and that would create uncertainty in our interpolated values. So here is our trend surface. It makes more sense looking at this in 3D. When we display order 1, which is a trend in one direction, now we see that the trend surface is slanted in one direction. And then we can go through, this is a polynomial of 1, here is a polynomial of 2, that means two curves, it becomes a more complex surface, and here we have an order of 3. A polynomial with the order of 2 we can barely see that there are now two trends in two different directions. The whole thing is slightly curved. And a polynomial of order 3 does not show much improvement. And we could go on and on and on, but at the end of the day, as you can see from the 3D image, the trend surface will not work at the end of the day. Now when we look at the inverse distance interpolation tool, of course our input file is clear, uh, the same input fields, we give it an output file name, same grid cell size, same environmental settings. So here the decisions we have to make is what power we want to use. So right now we have the default power of 2, so we're squaring the distances. Then we have our search radius, which right now we keep variable, and we're saying simply, right now let's start with a low number of points. For each location that we interpolate, we're looking for the six nearest points, and then use those values and the inverse distance weighting equation to calculate our value, our interpolated value. Let's see how this looks like. we see that the inverse distance weighting results in a very different types of pattern than the trend analysis, way more detailed. We see the influence of individual sampling points on the neighboring interpolated values, which makes sense. So let's see what the impact of our number of points has on the resulting surface. So here I'm using now 12 points to calculate. Not much different altogether, now I'm using 20 points. So that means, of course, the more points you use, the more you generalize. Comparing six points versus 12 points versus 20 points. So what happens if we, instead of having a variable search radius, we make this a fixed search radius? And here with my file names with F, I have fixed search radii with different distances, 50 to 400 meters. Here's my 50 meter search radius just like in density analysis, obviously too short of a distance to result in a meaningful interpolation. Here is the fixed radius. A radius, here's a fixed radius with a distance of 100. Here is a fixed meters. radius of 200 and 400 meters. And a fixed radius so again, of 400 meters. The larger the distance, the more points we include, the more we generalize our surface. So the question is, which one is really meaningful and which distance do we think is still a meaningful distance? But we are not done yet with our inverse distance options. What if we change our power value? Right now we use the power of 2. What if we use a power of only half? Here is the result if we only use a power of half. And again, 
with just 12 points included in our search, comparing the power of a half to the power of two, now the influence of points further away diminishes much faster than over here with a power of only half, and therefore the surface is much flatter. Here we have a power of 0.75, here we have a power of 1, going from a power of 2 to a power of 1, we see that the surface now does not go through the points anymore because points that are further away now have a stronger weight. And this gets worse as we reduce our power function to now 0.5. And so these are the options that you have to consider when you're doing IDW. Don't rely just on the default values. Experiment with a power, experiment with fixed radius versus variable radius, and with various search distances. And now let's look at the options using the spline function. The head information is all the same as before. The options here with the spline functions is, is it regularized or is it with tension? And do we give it a weight and how many points we have? The result looks like this. Here is a spline function regularized with a weight of zero and 12 points included quite a nice surface. Here we have a weight of 0.1. Here we have a weight of 1. Very small difference as you can see. A weight of 10. Now comparing spline weights. Here is a weight of 0 with 12 neighborhood points. a weight of 0.1, a weight of 1, and a weight of 10. When we compare a weight of 0, the lowest, with a weight of 10, the highest, we see that there are not significant changes. So the weight does not have a significant impact on your results. If we compare the point 1 with a tension point 1, so regularized point 1 weight versus tension point 1 weight, we see that with tension we have much sharper curves, we have tighter curves around our points when compared with regularized. Now we compare the regularized spline with spline with tension, and we can see that the spline with tension is flatter and does not allow as strong of deviations from the true points as the regularized spline does. Often the spline with tension results in better values around your sampled points. And then you may be inclined to calculate the contour lines from a resulting surface. So there we see the contour lines that we have created. Of course, we can control the interval and the labeling, etc., etc. Spline with tension, weight 0.1, 12 neighbors, versus the one that is regularized. Regularized and with tension you can see the difference. And finally, we have these and polygons that we can calculate from our points. These and polygons, of course, are not interpolated values, but these and polygons 
can still tell us something about what's going on within our closest neighborhood. Each polygon here contains the values of the sampling point and the edges of the polygons are always in the midpoint between neighboring sampling points. And at last, the most simple of all interpolation methods, the natural neighbor. We don't have any options. We simply put in the point file, define an output file, and off we go. And the result is always very true to the points. The surface will go through the points, at the points. The range of values will be between the minimum and maximum values, so honoring the samples. And compared to other methods, such as, for instance, here the spline, the spline, the natural neighbor, we see very similar patterns. Let's compare the natural neighbor maybe also to inverse distance weighting. And again, relatively speaking, similar patterns altogether. Much smoother with natural neighbor and spline than with IDW. That's all for today. Until next time. Thank you.